Hello friends, welcome to the Cold War Prepper. My name is Lee, and so I just want to kind of dispel a big rumor that's going around. Um, life is cyclical. We have four seasons. Uh, you know, we have fall, winter, spring, summer. Spring, the blue bonnets come out here in Texas. And when the blue bonnets come out, then we know that that's a signal of two things. Number one, the beginning of tornado and hail season. Number two, the beginning of, of uh, rattlesnake season. Then right after that, we have what I call paranoia and conspiracy theory. Uh, season, which is summer. So the U.S. military is divided into three major components. There's actually four, if you read the, the law. Uh, the fourth one is basically the, the, the militia, uh, and that is every able-bodied man between the ages of 18 and 45. <clears throat> I, you know, we probably need to amend that to everybody, able-bodied person. <clears throat> but the other three main components, you have the regular army, which I belong to for 21 years, you have the reserves, and then the third one is you have the National Guard. Now, the National Guard is really appealing to a lot of people because you get the great military training, uh, you get the promotions, you can get retirement and everything else, and your only obligation is one weekend a month and two weeks every summer. So that's where we are right now. We're in that two weeks every summer phase. So National Guard units, usually at a battalion level, and a battalion level is going to be somewhere around 12 to 1500 soldiers it can be anywhere around 100 to 150 vehicles are going to deploy from their um, armory to a training center so what happens is most armories are probably national guard armories are probably only company size so they're going to convoy so so and, and it's company for for some units it's also called a troop in the cavalry, same size. It's called a battery in artillery and air defense artillery. It's the same size unit. There, there, are, there are usually four of those to a battalion. Uh, so, and then uh, the battalion in the cav, they change that to a squadron instead of, you know, so you have four troops to a squadron uh, is a battalion. And uh, so, uh, uh, you know, that, those are the terminologies you want to see. But you, you've got these little places like Balmer, uh, I think it's Balmeray. There's a little town just north, Ballinger, it's Ballinger. There's a little town just north of San Angelo, okay? So the battalion headquarters is in San Angelo. There's a, there's a uh, battery in uh, Ballinger. And so when they get ready to deploy, they're going to convoy from Ballinger down to San Angelo then all those different batteries are going to get together with the battalion headquarters and they're going to be put on troop transports and they're going to be trucked from San Angelo all the way to Fort Hood so that they can use the live fire artillery ranges at Fort Hood. Now, if it was a little bit further, let's say they were going to go to the National Training Center in the Mojave Desert in California, then probably what they would do is they would put them on rail cars. So you'd see that same unit instead of being on low boys or instead of driving on the roads, they would be on rail cars. And so a lot of people are going to see a lot of military units on rail cars and go, think, oh my God, you know, that's terrible. No, it's standard. It's, it's National Guard training. So um, that's the first thing I want to warn you about. Now, now, when I was in the 337th ASA Company, now I believe it's A Company, uh, 101st MI Battalion of the 1st Infantry Division, Fort Riley, Kansas, uh, we would convoy down to Fort Sill, Oklahoma and jam, try to jam some of the artillery uh, training that was going on. And uh, so we drove all the way from Fort Riley to Fort Sill and all the way back. But we had all wheeled vehicles too. So, uh, you know, that was, that was something else. Another thing was at Fort Riley, we were the reforger unit. So that's redeployment of forces to Germany. So when we withdrew forces from Germany, uh, I think it was about 1955, we started reducing the number of units that we had in Germany down to just four divisions, two in fifth division, uh, fifth corps and two in seventh corps. And, uh, but our agreement with the German government was that we would redeploy an entire division to Germany within 72 hours after being requested. So we had to practice that. It usually happened every October. We would have uh, alerts almost, uh, if not monthly, at least every other month, where we would have to go in and prepare for, for reforger, uh, prepare to be redeployed, prepare to, to see action, whatever the case might be. And we did that six to eight times a year. So it's very common to have an alert practice within an organization. Just because organizations are doing alert practices right now does not mean that anything is imminent. So when you get called in on alert, of course, you're going to get dressed at home. You've got your field bag ready to go. In my case, it was a duffel bag and my uh, Alice pack 
So I, I had my Alice back and my field bag ready to go. Went in, got, got there, uh, threw that basically into my vehicle. I had an M151A1, which is a one quarter ton Jeep uh, with a, uh, uh, a trailer. And so I threw my duffel bag and I threw my, my uh, Alice pack in the back of the Jeep. Then I'd go back to the, to the armory, uh, get my M16. And uh, then I'd get my CBRN equipment, my mask and all that kind of stuff. And I mean, you are super busy. You're, you're topping off your fuel. You're doing your pre preventive maintenance, your pre-use inspection of your vehicle to make sure that everything is in operating order. You are busy like you would not believe. So uh, the, the chances that any, uh, anybody below battalion command staff would know whether this is for real or an exercise is slim to none. I mean, even when we did reforger, we would go through, uh, they had a field house on main post. We were building 89, uh, which was on Engineer Parade Fields, the same place where the, the commanding general lived. So uh, I, I can tell you stories about that too. But anyhow, um, so first MI company and uh, the 337th ASA company were both on Engineer Parade grounds. And uh, so we would have to um, go to the field house. And then, you know, when we were getting ready to deploy for, for a reforger, you took your blouse off and you rolled up both sleeves and you went through this this gamut uh and you had you know a medic on each side and he had this this humongous uh alcohol swab and he would swap your arms down and then you got 12 shots i mean you walked through you got 12 shots and the one i hated most was yellow fever i mean that uh, that was a killer from there you would turn around the first sergeant didn't like your haircut the first sergeant was a barber he had a barber kit issued to him and he would he would give you a haircut right then and there in preparation for deployment and then from there you turn around you go to the amnesty box so you took all your equipment you were in this uh, closed in it looked like a latrine almost if you had any contraband before you went to the to the sniffing dogs throw it in the contraband box and you were free uh, and then you had to stay in there for two minutes. And then from there, you'd go out. The, the sniffer dog would sniff all your equipment. If he sniffed something, the MPs would take you away. If not, you'd go to deployment and you'd get ready and you'd get on the truck or bus and then you'd go to the airfield, get on the airplane and, and fly away. And that's how it goes. So I can say probably the only time that we had a, a suspicion uh, that we were going into an armed conflict area was one time in the... Oh gosh, I want to say it was in the mid 70s. Uh, we were called on alert. We were put on a WC-141 uh, with our equipment at Salina Airport. And we were sitting there with the tailgate, uh, the tail ramp down on the C-141 so we could get fresh air. And uh, there was a five ton truck with live ammunition right behind us. So if that five ton truck had started issuing us live ammunition, uh, we would have known that we're going into combat. Uh, but otherwise, we didn't know for sure anything. So there was no way from the time we left Fort Riley and the time to, until the time we got on that C-141 for us to tell our loved one, this is for real, this is it, this is, this is a game or anything else we didn't know. Now, I will say that probably we didn't have cell phones back then. So now if I was sitting on the tail of that C-141, I could call and say, hey, you know, they're, they're, they're got ready to issue us live ammunition. So it looks like it could be a, a good thing. But I don't think most people are going to get it. I will tell you, in my opinion, as, as an officer, anybody below the battalion command staff is not going to know whether or not it's for real. So the battalion command staff, I'm going to say uh, battalion commander, the XO, the S3, the S2, uh, more than likely, maybe the S4, and the sergeant major. That's probably the only people are going to know uh, whether this is a live thing or whether it's, 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 it's an exercise. Uh, so anybody else trying to tell you their guess, it's going to be a guess. So just understand. You know, this is the season of training exercises. Oh, there's one more exercise coming up in September, October. It comes up every year. Every year people think it's martial law is imminent and uh, that Red Dawn is imminent and, and invasion is imminent. And that's the culminating exercise for the Special Forces Qualification Course and it's called Robin Sage. It happens every year. It has happened every year since 1965. Uh, now, here's something else you have to think about. If we're training for urban combat, okay, and if World War III is going to happen in Europe, or Europe is extremely urbanized, we don't do a lot of urban training here in the States. Uh, you know, the National Training Center is desert. You know, we might have a couple of mock small villages and stuff. But if you want to train for urban combat, how are you going to do it? You're going to train in an urban environment. 
So you may see more and more vehicles in urban settings simply because the chances are that we're going to be involved in a conflict in Europe and it's highly urbanized and we need the training. That's, that's how I would read that. But uh, so those are some thoughts from Lee and uh, uh, hope it does you some good. I'm going to include a couple links for you in the notes below. Number one is going to be a link to the television station of that unit that has the M109s that they're showing, that they're calling tanks, that they aren't tanks, they're, they're self-propelled artillery. Uh, so I'm going to give you a link to the local news radio station saying, hey guys, beware. First of the 148th Field Artillery, the M109A5 Paladins, are going to be returning home, returning back to their uh, armory from their annual training. And so it just so, so it happens, the right equipment, the right place, the right time, as this conspiracy theory uh, video that's going around on TikTok and on YouTube. Second thing is I want to give you a picture of an M109A5 Paladin. It is a self-propelled howitzer, 155 millimeter. It's a lot bigger, bulkier. You'll, if you take a look down below, it's got seven road wheels. You got the, 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 the drive wheel and the sprocket wheel, but it's got seven road wheels. Uh, it's got a very, it's very tall vehicle because it's behind the lines. It's not going to be involved in direct fire. Its armor is very thin. Of course, you can't see that, but it is very thin armor uh, in comparison to the, let's say, the M1 Abrams. Uh, so then I'm going to show you a picture of an M1 Abrams. I have a link for that. That is our main battle tank. So that's a lot squatter, l lower uh, silhouette, because it's going to be in direct contact with the enemy. So you don't want to have a big target. Now it does have a 120 millimeter smoothbore cannon. And uh, so that is a direct fire weapon. You're going to see who you're shooting at. Whereas with the artillery, somebody's directing your fire, giving you grid coordinates and stuff like that. Oh, somebody said, uh, that, that they expect that some soldier is going to tell them, let them know when, when uh, the situation is danger close. Be careful using military terminology. My daughter to this day says, Dad, it's okay to say, you, would you repeat that instead of say again? Because in the military, repeat means you're, you're talking to the artillery, put the next round where you put the last round when you shot. Uh, then again, danger close is a very specific uh, term as well. So when you're doing a call for fire, when you are calling into that artillery unit and telling them, hey, shoot the enemy, you want to let them know, double check your figures because you're going to be hitting or impacting, your shells are going to be impacting in an area where their splash could hit some of our troops. That is danger close. When your own artillery is landing close enough to injure your troops, that's danger close, okay? So uh, th there's a big difference between danger close and dangers imminent or imminent danger. Okay, uh, just a little bit of military terminology. Um, then the third one, I want, uh, third picture I want to show you is of an M2 Bradley fighting vehicle. Uh, it's a little bit taller uh, because you've got to have guys, you know, a squad of infantry sitting in the back. Um, it does have a 30 millimeter gun. It also has two tow uh, anti-tank rockets, uh, anti-tank missiles, uh, uh, guided missiles. Uh, and they're going to be in that sponson on the left side. And it, it'll flip up actually like this. Uh, you see a V painted on it, so when you're looking at it. So the M109 has seven road wheels. The M1 has, uh, no, let me go back. M109 has eight. The M1 has seven. The Bradley M2 has six. But anyhow, that's how it goes. Don't fret over a whole bunch of military vehicles and exercises going on throughout the United States. That's what they're meant to do. So do me a favor. Please remember we're all in this together so we can come out the other side together. Please be kind, polite, and respectful to each other because togetherness is the key. Take care. Bye-bye.